And I am delighted um, and quite flattered to tell you the truth that you all came out on such a um, snowy day. I can't believe I'm actually talking about snow in Tennessee, but on such a snowy day to talk about foreign policy and World War I. And as I've probably said to you before, the history that most all of us were taught growing up coming through school was really military history. And so what we're not going to do here is talk about a whole lot of battles, but I do want to spend some time uh, this week and next talking about how these various things in, in foreign policy, particularly associated with Woodrow Wilson and World War I, really did affect us here in Middle Tennessee and in, in the state of Tennessee as well. So I thought that in order to really kind of understand not only World War I, but Tennessee's response to World War I, and why we didn't get in, and then why we did get in, and how Tennesseans felt about it, I thought it might be good to spend two or three minutes just giving you an outline of American, the big points of military history, our engagements. And these are only the big highlights that I have put on. There are thousands of other pieces that could be added in between the lines here. But our first real military experience, aside from constantly fighting with the Indians over land, really was the French and Indian War, which was one of these global wars, a world war, that had been taking place from time to time between Great Britain and somebody else, some part of Europe, uh, in this case France, uh, and it was always over territory, and the thing that really had prompted all of this was Spain's arrival uh, and claims uh, in 1492 and beyond, and, and the history and the competition between the countries of Europe for empire. They were all attempting to build some kind of empire, and they fought over it. The difference between this war and all the others, the three that had happened before this, was that this war was fought in North America. The people living in the 13 colonies, they knew this war was going on, but they didn't really, uh, they, they knew the other wars were going on, but they didn't pay a whole lot of attention to them because they had nothing to do with them. But this war really began because we were uh, expanding so rapidly as 13 colonies westward, and uh, we bumped into the French when we got over there to the a uh, place where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers come together to form the Ohio, where Pittsburgh is today. So, as you do know from your American history classes, uh, the period after the French and Indian War from 1763 to 1766, 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was actually uh, finally signed, uh, was, it was just kind of one thing after another. Uh, Britain would pass a law and we didn't like it, and we would complain, and then Britain would come along and say, okay, we'll take that one back, but we're going to pass another one. And so it was just a series of act after act and response after response on our part until finally uh, uh, the colonists sent representatives to Philadelphia. A document was draw, uh, drawn up, the Declaration of Independence, and we began a war with Great Britain, a war that had in many respects already been going on for a, quite a long time because um, Lexington and Concord had happened uh, uh, a year before. So the Revolutionary War gave us our independence. Now, George Washington became president in 1789 when we had adopted the Constitution, changed horses, really. We thought we wanted to just be a confederacy of states, and then it turned out uh, after about 10 years of that, that wasn't working so well, and we decided we needed a stronger central government. And it was really George Washington's military experience more than anything else that made him a Virginian, a slave owner, uh, really uh, determined that the states had to give some authority to some kind of central government. So Washington was sworn in. He served two terms. Um, during a fair part of those two terms, 
Washington had his hands full because we had uh, had the support of France during the Revolutionary War, and yet uh, we did not want to support them when they declared war on Great Britain after Napoleon rose to power. So it was only the quick thinking and actual reading of what we had signed, read the contract you signed with the uh, whoever, uh, that uh, John Adams was able to somewhat come up with a way to keep us from having to side with France. The treaty that we had signed that brought France into the Revolutionary War on our side said that we would defend France not just any old time you go to war, but we would defend France if you are attacked by another country. And it was Napoleon that had uh, declared war on Great Britain, and so we escaped being involved in that war. And Washington, the last term of his presidency, he was really uh, doing everything he could to keep us out of that European war because some Americans really thought we ought to support France and some Americans thought we ought to stay out of it. So Washington announced in 1796 that he was leaving office at the end of his second term. And as he is preparing to hand over the presidency to somebody else, he starts thinking about his vision for the country. He talks to Alexander Hamilton, his Secretary of Treasury, who helps him write a document that becomes known as Washington's Farewell Address. But the, the address was not exactly his farewell, but it was his vision for this country. In other words, okay folks, look at what we've accomplished. I don't want you who are coming later to make mistakes and have to go back to square one. I want you to learn what this country is. And he, in this uh, farewell address, he, he made a big point about the fact that um, uh, we were lucky in that we have all of this abundant land to the west for growth, and yet we have this Atlantic Ocean, 3,000 miles of water, to protect us from Europe. So he made it very clear that he felt that the United States should always avoid what he referred to as entangling alliances. Don't be signing on to help somebody. You've got 3,000 miles between your, you and Europe, and they're going to keep fighting these wars forever. And indeed, uh, that sort of proved out. So, uh, uh, one generation uh, gets older, and another one comes up, and uh, particularly people who are living over here in Tennessee in 1810 and 11 and 12, they don't remember much about the Revolutionary War. It's a younger group of, of, of feisty people who want to make their mark, and they are just irritated with the way Great Britain's treating us. And uh, they're stopping our ships on the sea, and they're doing this and that and the other. They've still got some forts up there in the Great Lakes area that they're not supposed to have, and we, above all, think that Great Britain is selling guns to Indians to, to just get back at us. And so uh, at, there is a group in Congress that become known as the Warhawks, and they're all from the South and the West, meaning here in Kentucky, Henry Clay, Felix Grundy uh, from Tennessee, and um, John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. So President Madison, without a real single spark, and that whole concept of a single spark, I think, is fairly interesting to consider when we go to war and when we don't. Without a specific single spark, Congress, at President Madison's urging, goes to uh, de declares war against Great Britain, thus entering the War of 1812. And of course, our militia, led by General Jackson, is very enthusiastic, and this provides us, particularly us, right here in Middle Tennessee, a chance to go down south and sort of evict the Indians that are living beyond the 
Tennessee, Alabama border. And so we have kind of two wars there, uh, the War of 1812, and within that war is a war against the Creeks and other Indians too. So we got involved in that war. Uh, we, it, we managed to get out by the skin of our teeth. Um, the British sacked our capital before the thing was all over. We were really ready to just say, let's have a peace treaty, everything, let's just go back to the way it was. The treaty had actually been written but hadn't been ratified by Congress when General Jackson uh, uh, miraculously uh, wins this battle. Well, it wasn't a miracle. He was out. He was everything about it. He was in the superior position, the Battle of New Orleans. And so that was our foreign policy foray, dear for that generation. And then here comes James K. Polk, and we have another little foray into foreign affairs. This time we are squabbling over the border between our newest state, Texas, and Mexico. And Texas had, had uh, claimed the border was all the way to the Rio Grande River. And Mexico said, oh, no, it's the Nueces River. You're claiming more land than Texas actually w it had. So we go to war with Mexico. Again, President Polk went to Congress and said, we need to do this. And this was the war, not really the War of 1812, but it was at this point that President Polk called for volunteers. You know, we didn't want a standing army, so we didn't really, couldn't just put the army into service. He called up volunteers, and the volunteers meant the militias of every state. Every state had a, had a militia back when they were colonies. Every colony had had a militia to protect the community to protect your colony, now your state. And the Tennessee militia uh, is called on by President Polk, as is every other state's militia, to send troops. And, and President Polk uh, and his advisors, they will prorate the number of soldiers they want from a state. So they asked Tennessee for 3,000 men in two regiments. And with this call for volunteers to join our militia, 30,000 of us sign up. Thus, we really take pride in calling ourselves the volunteer state. Now, if you go into these cemeteries, which I have been known to do on occasion, um, <laughs> If you go into these cemeteries, particularly military cemeteries, and look at the military headstones because they're very specific. Uh, Tennessee regular, that's somebody in the regular army, but more likely than not, these before the Civil War will see, say, 1st Tennessee Vol regiment, so on and so forth. So you can see which ones were the militia members uh, when you look at those numbers. So we have war with Mexico. It comes out great. We, we win. We get the land all the way to California. Everybody here is happy. And then comes the Civil War. And I think for us as Southerners militarily, this is really a, a big turning point for us in a whole bunch of different, different ways. You know, more than any other part of the country, Southerners, the South, has been shaped by war, and particularly the Civil War. Uh, one Southerner had written after the Civil War ended, and we were all reunited again, uh, he had written that now we're all going to be called Yankees. And that was very troubling to him, this. But as you know, um, the South has always had this slightly militaristic uh, element of society. Uh, there was always uh, a gun culture in the South, always a gun culture. Uh, there was an interest in sporting events like cockfighting in the South. Things of that nature were much more popular here than they were uh, in the North. And so here we see the Civil War reminding us of the true horrors of war as our part of the country. If you, if you consider the Confederate States to be an independent nation, 
which you may or may not, if you are a Southerner and a, a still, still see yourself as a Southerner, you probably think that it is an independent nation. But whatever, um, if you see yourself as an independent nation, we, our country, was invaded. Now, again, there are different ways to look at that, but they, 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 Southerners would say that the, we were invaded by the Union Army. And so then we more or less stay out of affairs until William McKinley becomes president and we get a little bit antsy and this is the role of journalism like we've never seen it in the country before because we've got Joseph Pulitzer running one big newspaper empire and we've got William Randolph Hearst running another one and so the whole thing is how can we sell newspapers? How, and well, the way we can do it is by having really great headlines that will grab people's attention. And so um, photography has come into its own as a news source. And so the newspapers are incorporating ph photography in some of their newspapers. And as a result of that, uh, uh, Frederick Remington has been sent down to Cuba to get some photographs of what's going on. Now, Cuba was one of the last, last holes of Spain. Spain had had this big colonial empire over here, but almost all of the, the Spanish uh, colonies in Central and South America had one had, had declared independence and were independent countries, Mexico, Central America, South America, so on and so forth. But Spain still, still held Cuba. And the United States had been very interested in Cuba a lot of different times. Southerners before the Civil War, for instance, were interested in Cuba because if we could take Cuba, we could make that another cotton growing state, another slave state, and then we would have another two votes in the U.S. Senate where uh, the count really did matter. So we've been interested in Cuba and the Caribbean and Central America for a long time. Uh, but the Spanish-American War really began by Actually, it was called our entry, our de declaration of war against Spain, a single spark. An American ship finds itself in 1898 in Havana Harbor. It's a steamship. What's it doing there? We know not. But the steamship is there and it explodes. Now, you may remember that steam power was really great except for the fact that steam engines from time to time exploded and the death counts were horrendous any time a steam ship or a steam boat or a steam ship exploded. So when the main exploded, Spain said, I don't know why this happened, but the newspaper said, oh, it was an act of, we would call it, terrorism. They blew up our ship. And so there's just sensational journalism about the blowing up of the main, clearly making the point that Spain did it, and we go to war with them. And uh, we were so eager to go to war because the Civil War generations pretty much uh, all uh, dying out and we hadn't had a war and these young men like Theodore Roosevelt are so excited he resigns his position goes back to uh, his Harvard uh, classmates organizes his polo team as a cavalry unit and they have a dramatic charge and the war uh, is as he said it Theodore Roosevelt himself a splendid little war now, this war is actually really important for us, the United States, as we look at World War I. Because one of the things that happened when we declared war on Spain was that we had this, you know, we've got the Panama Canal coming. The idea is in our head. We want the Panama Canal to be built, but uh, the French have not been able to do it, but you know they're not going to be able to. 
you know, you know, they're not, they're not capable of an engineering project of this magnitude. Uh, and, and we are looking over there at Asia because our industries are doing so well. We've got more industrial production than we as a nation can consume. And we are looking not for labor, not for cheap labor, but we are looking for new markets. And there is China still not carved up by the nations of Europe as Africa had been. So we need a way to get into Asia. And there we have a Pacific fleet uh, led by Admiral Dewey, uh, who is stationed in our, our newest holding, Hawaii. And um, at the time we declare war on Spain, our Pacific fleet just happens to be in Manila Bay. So we take the Philippines. We liberate the Philippines. Isn't this what this is all about? Liberating people from this monarchist, uh, antiquated uh, country, Spain. And we took the Philippines, or freed them, but then they thought, they welcomed, the Filipinos welcomed us with open arms because we were freeing them. They could run their own business. It's independence. No, it's not. We gave Cuba their independence. We didn't have any, uh, any qualms about that. But the Philippines were another matter. We just couldn't quite say it's yours. It, we just couldn't quite say you all have the capability of running your own country. And so we enter, as soon as one war ends, we enter a four-year war between ourselves. This is part of the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War officially ended in about four months. But uh, then we have this four-year war in the Philippines with the United States troops fighting the native Filipinos who want to be independent. And so we ultimately put down Emilio Aguinaldo and his supporters, but lots and lots of Americans died in the Philippines far more than died in Cuba or any other part of this Spanish-American War. So we now have colonies that we have actively taken. And I think that is, is an important thing to kind of look at as we move to World War I uh, that breaks out in Europe in 1914. Now, the part of this story that many of you probably really uh, don't have a lot of understanding about is the fact that before and, and during the first part of World War I, we were really at war again with Mexico. This time, uh, it was who was going to be the president of Mexico that caused us to uh, get involved in Mexico again. So we, Woodrow Wilson is having problems from the beginning of his first term of office managing foreign relations because his idealism, his commitment to Christian, moral, biblical principles is tested in foreign affairs. With regards to um, uh, domestic affairs, he can, he can deal with that with his idealism and his principles. We want to make the United States a better place by, by helping people, by having a better road system, this, that, and the other. But with this subject of foreign affairs, how do we deal with other countries? Wilson is a little grayer. And, and Wilson has appointed, um, when he became president, he appointed to be his Secretary of State none other than William Jennings Bryan, who had run for president several times, still a Democratic Party uh, nostalgic uh, a character as late as Harry Truman. One of Harry Truman's speeches, he talked about uh, about uh, William Jennings, the tradition of William Jennings Bryan. So we're gonna we're gonna be involved in Mexico before World War One. So we have at, we World War One. You know the end of this story too. Uh, 
we don't bring about that lasting peace and we have World War II and then from there all of you know the rest of the story. So uh, let's look at the policies of these progressive presidents. Theodore Roosevelt, who was a kind of a bully in a way, uh, he, he wanted the Panama Canal. He was the one that engineered Panama's independence from Colombia. And then when Panama won, it, won its independence, they were very gracious because we had provided them weapons and other things to win independence. They were very, he, he, Panama was very gracious and gave us a big right of way across their country to build this canal. So we refer to Teddy Roosevelt's diplomacy as big stick diplomacy. One of the things he said that has etched on everybody's mind is speak softly and carry a big, big stick. And lots of other American presidents have kind of built on that in one way or another. If we are, are defensively very, very powerful, nobody will bother us because they will be scared of us. And that was the way that, that Teddy Roosevelt felt. Now, William Howard Taft was much more um, in communication with the business community, Wall Street, uh, than Roosevelt was. Roosevelt irritated Wall Street tremendously. He irritated the rank and file of the traditional Republican Party that had elected William McKinley and the Republican presidents before William McKinley. Uh, Roosevelt uh, uh, had great hopes for William Howard Taft becoming his uh, uh, successor. But William Howard Taft said, you know, we just can't go in there carrying a stick and threatening everybody. That for one thing, it's going to cost us money. And Wall Street was uh, very much in communication with Taft all along the way. So Taft says, rather than just jumping willy-nilly into a war every time uh, there's some, something we need to get involved in or think we need to get involved in, we need to only get involved in countries, things going on in other countries, if we have a financial investment. And, and we kind of you know, think all this notion of a lot of American investments all around the world is a fairly new thing. But this was going on well before 1900 as we had in, uh, industrialized. We were looking for markets and raw materials to keep our ma uh, machine going. So here comes the highly idealistic, idealistic highly religious Woodrow Wilson. And he goes into the White House, and everybody is very curious as to what he's going to say. Well, he's going to say, we're going to deal with other countries based on our moral principles. And he makes that very clear. It's not going to be self-interest, as he saw Taft's uh, uh, dollar diplomacy as being self-interest. It's not going to be the bully pulpit or uh, uh, the big stick diplomacy of Theodore Roosevelt. We are going to deal with countries only based on our moral principles and specifically related to South America and Central America. He said that we will deal with uh, these countries and treat them with equality and honor. So here was Wilson. He was kind of suspicious of Wall Street anyway. And uh, he immediately kind of follows through with this because there had been a big investment scheme in China, no less. And uh, it implied that the United States had an obligation to intervene when um, China had decided uh, to, to, to not support this project any longer. And the investors felt their money was being threatened, so they got word to the president, and President Wilson said, no, we're not going to intervene. If Wall Street wants to intervene in China and risk its money there, Wall Street can risk the money there, but we as a nation are not going to get involved. And so 
Wilson made that very clear. Now, William Jennings Bryan, Secretary of State, is clearly a Christian pacifist. He had come up through the same religious traditions that Wilson had come up through. He believed that the only time you ever, ever went to war was for self-defense. No other reason was acceptable. And it was William Jennings Bryan who set forth this notion that if countries can just talk about the problems, we can avoid war. If there's some kind of, if nations are in such a disagreement uh, as, as France and Germany had been in the late 1860s, if they are in so much disagreement that they're about to go to war, we need to bring in a mediator and ta let both sides talk before we actually, uh, 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 before they go to war. So with the president's approval, William Jennings Bryan went to 30 different nations and he negotiated these conciliation treaties that, we, that they would sign. 30 of these treaties were signed saying that they would talk any disputes that they might have with another country out and wait one full year before going to war. Brian believed this cooling off period would, would end a lot of fighting, save a lot of lives, and he believed that conflicts could be uh, solved without military force. Wilson and Brian had no intentions of becoming another Teddy Roosevelt. So R Wilson is going to try as hard as he can to set a different course for the United States. But what he finds within a month or two after he has been sworn in is that that is a harder thing to do than he had believed. Because Wilson, just like everybody else, was a creature of assumptions. He assumed certain things about our country, certain things about us. We had been chosen by God. Our race was a superior race. And being a Southerner, he, he believed he was kind to African Americans, but he believed that white people were superior to African Americans. He didn't support all this lynching going on in the South, but by the same token, he felt that, that African Americans were never going to be equal with other uh, white Americans. So he had this sort of paternalistic view. He was certainly courteous to the Latin American countries, the, the uh, uh, ambassadors and ministers that were sent to Washington. But Woodrow Wilson, I don't think, really saw these other countries as our equals. Uh, they were small. They, they just were not nearly as advanced as we were. So what Wilson wanted to do is set a really good example uh, here in the United States and hope these Latin American countries would follow our really good example and, and that's what he wanted to do, but at the same time, he also had in his heart the soul of a missionary. If, if your religion is not as advanced as our religion, we need to save your soul. If your economic system is not as advanced as our economic system, we need to tell you, show you how to do, make that a better system. We need to look at your government and we will set a good example of what good government should be. It will be us as a role model, particularly for Central and South America. Now, let me tell you folks, there was no country in all of Central and South America that was in any more turmoil than was the country of Haiti. Haiti has always had uh, a problem with stability. And if, you know, one of the things I remember the most about that uh, Jared Diamond book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, I always want to call him Neil Diamond. Uh, Jared Diamond, uh, you all know why. Uh, Jared Diamond, uh, 
uh, he had a map, uh, uh, an aerial photograph of the island of Hispaniola. Haiti is on one end, the Dominican Republic on another, and the point of this map, this uh, aerial shot was of the island, was that the Dominican Republic side of the line is all green and forest, and the Haiti side of the line is just desolate. It's just, you know, all the trees have been cut down. Uh, it, it's desolate. And that made it, that was one thing out of that book that made a big impression on me, that picture of, of Haiti from above. Uh, between 1911 and 1915, four years, seven presidents of Haiti had been assassinated. Uh, and so after the la latest president, 1915, Wilson in the White House, is assassinated in Haiti, uh, the place just is complete chaos. It breaks completely apart. It is uh, factionalism. Nobody has control. It is a very, very dangerous place to be. So Woodrow Wilson, who has a lot of misgivings uh, from, from, from long before he was president, of ever sending troops anywhere, American soldiers, he orders the Marines into Haiti, and they will end up staying in Haiti until 1934. They were there to keep order. Uh, the next year he ends up sending Marines into uh, the Dominican public, Republic right there on the same island. So we had been involved in Haiti for a good long while. Uh, we had had the military there to protect American investments, something that Wilson had said he wasn't interested in doing. But when the situation became totally unstable, he said, this is not exactly a real invasion. This is just, we're just there to prevent anarchy from uh, uh, happening and we're there to save lives. So we were really concerned by the time this takes place in 1915 about Haiti because of the war in Europe. And uh, that was what really had our attention, whether Wilson really talked very much about that or not, but Scott Berg, um, who went through all of the Wilson uh, 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 papers, said that Wilson clearly was concerned about Germany in 1915, World War I, had begun in Europe. They were still calling it the European War, at least the British were, uh, in 1915. But Wilson was very concerned that Germany might come in and invade Haiti if we weren't there to stop that from happening. So we uh, see World War I now beginning, and we are, of course, a nation that sees our foreign policy as based solely on isolationism, and we are going to valiantly try to stay out of the war in Europe. So we have things over here in, in North America and South America to deal with, but we don't need to really worry too much about the war going on in Europe. But here we go again. Mexico is now a, a country that is showing many, many signs of political instability. And we are quite concerned about the instability going on in Mexico. And we will, for all practical purposes, go to war with a contingency in Mexico, uh, not the whole country, but a contingency in Mexico in 1915 and 16, uh, right before we get involved in uh, World War I. Now, I think this is the point at which I need to stop, and since these are all our Tennessee National Guard, and tell you a little bit about the uh, Tennessee militia and how it morphed into becoming the Tennessee National Guard. Now, the militias had always been the troops in the states. They had no constitutional or authority under the public laws of the United States, but they were there for the president, any president, to call up any time they needed uh, soldiers, they would call them up. And we really didn't see Congress doing ever much of anything, anything about these militias until about 1903, 
when Congress started making a few rules, and from 1903 to 1916, uh, you see Congress passing several different bills related to these states' volunteer armies. In 1916, with the war in Europe going on, uh, Congress, at the request of President Wilson, passes the National Defense Act, which gave the United States military establishment, the, uh, they would be under the Secretary of War, mind you, we didn't have a Secretary of State and a Secretary, well, we did have a Secretary of State, but we didn't have a Secretary of Defense. So, they would be under the Secretary of War, and the militias are now getting put officially on the U.S. military flowchart. And so here we've created this. The, the national government is going to control these state militias, and they're going to call them not the Tennessee Home Guard, which some people call it, not the Tennessee militia, but the Tennessee National Guard. And that was going to be all the way across the country. Uh, they will now be under the complete authority. Now this is actually really one of those progressive ideas if you look back at progressivism because progressivism was from the beginning giving the national government's bureaucracy authority over things that they felt the states could not take care of. And so we see the national government really expanding in the progressive era with all of the things that Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and now Woodrow Wilson are doing. So it's we need centralization and centralization means translates in the view of the progressives, centralization translates into efficiency. So this was a logical progressive idea. Organization, uh, lots of research, lots of scientific methods in the things that the progressives uh, sponsored and supported. So now the National Guard is officially in 1916, with the war going on over there, but not here, the National Guard, the Tennessee National Guard, is now officially a branch of the U.S. official military establishment. Now, Mexico has always been on our mind, always, always, because um, they were just right down there south of the border, and we often were not happy with the government there. Because we were so close to Mexico, and because there were a whole lot of mines down there, lots of opportunities for investment, and of course, the big money in the United States after the Civil War had initially been made in the railroad business, and then that expanded to lots of other things. So United States railroad com companies wanted to build railroads a and create a, a sophisticated, modern railway system for the country of Mexico, and they were already down there investing money hand over fist. And so we had a lot of Mexican investments by Americans and British during the Taft presidency. And uh, the, the troubling thing in the Taft presidency was that the existing Mexican president, uh, Americans referred to him as a dictator, but he was a, a president and he had been the president for 35 years. Porfirio Diaz had been overthrown. And we got very concerned about our investments in Mexico. And so when another uh, leader takes over Mexico, and this leader, Francisco Madero, is really getting a lot of support from the locals by saying we want to get all these foreigners out of our country, uh, we began to get worried because Americans, by 1911, the United States had 
$2 billion of personal and banking corporate investments in Mexico. Britain had uh, a lot of investments, but it was sm small compared to us. We had railroads, we had oil wells, we, had, we owned more mines than the Mexicans themselves owned. We were heavily invested. So yes, Wilson, uh, you have a dollar diplomacy issue. Taft had certainly seen that as dollar diplomacy. Our money is down there and being threatened. So Wilson is going to have to pick up where Taft left off, whether he likes it or not. So here is this uh, new revolutionary leader in Mexico, Francisco Madera. And you know, he and Woodrow Wilson never met, but if you look at the biographies of both of these men, they really had kind of a similar track. They were highly educated, they enjoyed literature, uh, they never met, but they sort of had the same kind of vision for their country. But uh, here we have uh, the time of Wilson being inaugurated and this president once again being overthrown, another military coup, uh, by another faction of Mexican politics, Victoriano Huerta, who, you know, he was one of these hard-drinking, no-nonsense kinds of leader who got the support of people, at least initially, uh, by just staging a coup. But then they go f one step further in his coup, in Huerta's coup, and they immediately execute Madero. Well, this is the scene on which Woodrow Wilson becomes president, and Woodrow Wilson makes it very clear as soon as he hears that this has happened. The United States will not deal with a government of butchers. And he labeled the Huerta regime as butchers. The British had actually recognized Huerta, and Woodrow Wilson convinced the British to withdraw their recognition of Huerta. And so what, what Wilson was aware of that Britain didn't have the information about was that there was opposition to, there was opposition to Huerta that was coalescing around another leader, Venustiano Carranza. And Wilson and the United States investment community liked him a lot better than Huerta. Well, the, Vistun the Carranza forces and the Huerta forces, uh, they start fighting. And what you see in Mexico is nothing but civil war. So President Wilson, he's been in the White House uh, just uh, uh, about uh, a year or so, he decides he has to intervene in Mexico. So we send soldiers, we send a boat, down to Mexico, we've got some Marines and some sailors on this boat, and seven of our Marines, our sailors, get off the boat. The boat's just down there, it's not doing anything, but the sailors get off the boat and go on, on leave into the city of Tampico, where they are arrested by one of Huerta's colonels. Now let me tell you, Huerta may have been a kind of a strong-armed guy, but he didn't want to go to war with the United States, so he releases these men almost immediately. When he finds out that his men have uh, taken these American sailors, uh, he gets them released. He doesn't want to go to war. Well, the admiral out there on that boat, Admiral Henry Mayo, he makes an executive decision right there that some might say was a little bit excessive. He says, okay, we've got our sailors back. That's great. That's what you were supposed to do. Now, Mexico, we want you to give us a 21-gun salute. <laughs> and he... The, the admiral claimed that our honor had been insulted, uh, that this whole incident had been totally humiliating, and uh, he uh, also, uh, um, he actually knew that there was a German ship headed that way with guns for Huerta, and he wanted to kind of make a big show of all of this. The admiral did. So... Uh, 
he says, you're going to have to give us a 21-gun salute. Now, let me tell you, folks, they didn't really like the Mexican government, the country of Mexico, the people of Mexico, did not really like the outcome of the Mexican War way back in 1846. <laughs> Taking all that land from them, they were still mad about it. They hadn't gotten over that yet. So we're not going to have, have a, a lot of sympathy with the citizenry of Mexico but because there was widespread dislike of us for grabbing all of that land all the way to California in their opinion, uh, in the opinion of Mexico. So Carranza is a little bit worried about all of this, but what Wilson decides to do is send troops in to Veracruz, the same place where General Winfield Scott had gone to start his invasion of Mexico City in the Mexican War. And here we are actually going in over something really, really silly. And so, to Wilson's surprise, to say nothing of the Marines and the Navy and everybody else, uh, the Mexicans are not happy to see us there on land that we've made this landing. And so Wilson gets really kind of scared. And I think the other nations of Central and South America are looking at all of this and they're, they're feeling kind of scared themselves because, you know, they, if, you, if you believe that dominoes fall one after another, well, there's Mexico. Uh, what's going to be next? So... Argentina, Brazil, and Chile send word to President Wilson that they want to mediate this crisis between the United States and Mexico, the United States and General Huerta, or President Huerta, who, whatever you want to call him. They want to mediate this to keep a war from breaking out, to keep the United States from taking Mexico. So before the crisis could be evolved in, uh, but be resolved, keep in mind, you've got the Civil War kind of going on in Mexico anyway. Carranza's men finally overtake Huerta's men and take uh, over Mexico. So, you know, we just have coup after coup after coup here in a very short period of time. So Carranza, we like him. We're going to recognize him immediately. And things are going to be, we consider, they're going to be much more stable under Carranza than they were under Huerta. So we're feeling pretty good about this. And then wouldn't you know it, one of Carranza's generals uh, falls out with Carranza. This general, Dorotego Arango, if I mention his name to you or when I do, you will know what we prefer to call him in this country. Pancho Villa. So, he's been, he's been kind of for a long time, uh, you know, you call him a, a part-time bandit. He's very popular with the local people. He pretty much controls one of those provinces of Mexico, Chihuahua. He has a very loyal force of people there. He is a superb guerrilla commander. So needless to see, Pancho Villa really uh, initially because he's just so darn colorful, you know, with those bullets all the way across his, his you know, is, is something you can take pictures of here and run in your newspaper, preferably on the front page. So Pancho Villa, initially the American press just adore this guy. They even refer to him as the Robin Hood of Mexico. Uh, so I'm sure that Pancho Villa just loved this role and played it for all it was worth. He enjoyed it so much. So Wilson initially thought there was no real problem with Pancho Villa. I mean, he might actually, if he can work with Carranza, he might actually uh, uh, be the best hope for stability. And, you know, he might actually be better than Carranza, even though we've already recognized Carranza. So Wilson is initially not too upset 
about Pancho Villa and anything he might do until things get worse between Carranza and Pancho Villa. And uh, I think Pancho Villa was a really smart guy. I think that he looked at us and he thought, I can create chaos down here. If the United States intervenes down here for whatever reason, the country is going to completely fall apart and we are going to have an opportunity where I, Pancho Villa, can come to power, can seize power and take over. So, again, keep in mind we got a lot of investments down there, engineers, bridges, railroads. So Pancho Villa stops a train coming into Mexico, coming across the border, on which <coughs> there are American engineers who have been requested by Carranza to come in to Mexico to reopen an abandoned mine and do some work on the railroads there. So in they come. Villa and his very loyal men stop the train. They make all of the engineers get off the train and they promptly shoot every one of them and kill them. One lived. I don't know why they did not shoot all of them, but they shot all but one. Well, you were right, Pancho Villa. Guess who's coming now? So here comes the United States. Uh, it, you know, this is just kind of like those old westerns we all used to see. It's kind of a big old shoot 'em up now. Uh, so we're going down. So Carranza, he's going to go run Pancho Villa down. So here comes Carranza's army to, to make things right for us, the United States. But Woodrow Wilson and our military leaders don't even give Carranza a chance to put it down. Instead, Wilson calls for General John J. Pershing, Black Jack Pershing, to take 6,000 troops to Mexico and go in to capture this bandit general. So here comes General Pershing, and of course he's going to have to have the militia. So the Tennessee National Guard, three weeks after this bill had been passed in 1916 to put all the National Guards under the Secretary of War, three weeks later, the Tennessee Guard is headed to Mexico. And you know, initially we always love going to war. I mean, it's just a kind of a thing that, you know, this is going to be great. We're going to go down there and teach them a lesson. And time after time after time, we don't ever think about people getting killed. We just never think that it might be my son or your son or your son or your brother or your husband or whoever. We are quite interested in setting things right down there. So here we come and the Tennessee volunteers will be called up they will come here to Nashville after they are called up. They will appear here in Nashville for training and, um, I guess, some kind of orientation and induction into the Army. The Tennesseans are excited about going. And the, the former militia, now National Guard, it is all crosswalks of life. There are doctors, there are lawyers, there are farmers, there are factory workers. And this is just kind of a something that, that they're very excited about doing. So they, they understand they're going to be gone for two months. And uh, it'll be great to see some different countryside. And so they are called up and they head down to the Texas Mexico border. Well, that's really kind of where their good times ended. Because number one, it was uh, six months. And you know, we think it's kind of hot here. Uh, they, they 
thought it was really hot uh, down there on the border, and uh, they really felt that they they had they were in something ugly. And so the Tennessee volunteers go down there to the the border, actually feeling quite excited. Brave Tennesseans, we must hasten to the frontier, or we will find it drenched in the blood of our fellow citizens. Uh, but instead, what actually happens, I love this cartoon, uh, what actually happens here with all of this is that after Pancho Villa has several different things, he invades uh, New Mexico, uh, the city of Columbus is absolutely burned. You can see the buildings burning there and the place where it was prior to be uh, uh, the, what it looked like after the fire was off. Uh, we were very disillusioned by all of this, and the, the coverage of this in Tennessee after it's all over was, was pretty bad. People were not, not happy. Oh, I did want you all to see that. I forgot. That's one of the lieutenants that was with Pershing down there. Uh, uh, Lieutenant George Patton. Uh, so... In the course of doing this, we, the United States, have managed to alienate every single faction in the country of Mexico. And a whole year of us down there, and Wilson agonizing. I mean, he was a, a person ten, who tended to depression, and he agonized over young men being killed. Uh, he was depressed. He could not speak to people for days. He was so upset about all of this. In January 1917, Wilson will call Pershing back home. Pershing hadn't really accomplished much of anything. Uh, Pershing and the troops are, that are still down there will come home. And it wasn't that Wilson was conceding defeat. Uh, you know, it wasn't that. But he realized with, by January of 1917, I think Wilson was coming to realize very quickly that whether we wanted to or not, we are going to go to war. We are going to have to get involved in the European war, the war that's going on in Europe, World War One. It's been going on since 1914, and we're going to have to get involved whether we like it or not. So that's how our Mexico experience uh, has taken place. And I, I'm, the reason I'm spending so much time on this, which is a relatively obscure part of history, is because it, it kind of explains some of the things that take place here in uh, the United States as we are making our decision to go to war uh, to enter the European war. We've talked about this before. This man was an idealistic man. He, he wanted to apply his principles, but he was also a person with great certainty. He was absolutely certain that his ways and ideas were always good for this country, uh, uh, no matter what the opposition said to the contrary. Now, we're going to stop here in just a minute, but before we leave, because time is almost up, I want to give you all a little summary of, of, of World War I, and then next week we're going to talk completely about the U.S. experience, and we're going to talk about Nashville's experience, the Tennesseans who received the Medal of Honor, uh, the one who we, whose name we recognize, Alvin York, some lesser-known heroes, and I think it's time to talk about the women after we've talked about men for a solid hour, don't you? So we'll be talking about the women next week, too. So we'll try, John gentlemen, not to do too much male bashing. Uh, now, all right, I always like to bring a book, that is if I can find it on my bookshelf. Uh, I, this is a book that I think some of you would read. Now, I know Rick's read this book, haven't you? Didn't you read this one, 1913? Uh, this book is, is not exactly just a spellbinding read. 
but it's it's a inter there are several points that the author and I think he's from Australia Charles Charles Emerson that's Emerson with two M's uh, Charles Emerson wrote this book 1913 in search of the world before the Great War and it's really his travel log I mean he he was a journalist and he went to all of these countries and he wrote about them he he went as a contemporary person you know 10 years ago or five years ago and then he wrote a book about these countries as they were in 1913 so you have the countries that are kind of the the most important ones on the face of the earth then you have the old world you have the world beyond and the twilight powers and it's these twilight powers that really are the ones that are going to crumble as a result of World War I. I. I said at the time we read this book uh, that, that if I ever go to any of these places, and I'd already been to Vienna before I read this book, but if I go to them again, I will get this book and just read the chapter on Vienna or the chapter on St. Petersburg or uh, any of the other places that are uh, described here because it really is quite an interesting book. The old world uh, powers and the new world powers and the United States will come out of World War I as the only real winner of the war. We came out a very, very powerful nation. So I highly recommend that book. Now, I will recommend another book about Europe before uh, 1913, which some of you I know have already read. Uh, Barbara Tuckman's The Proud Tower is one of the finest books I've ever read. I thought, I think she might have written it in 60 something, 1960 something. It really is still a fine, fine, beautiful book. Uh, there, uh, you can get it at your public library. It's all over the place. You can probably pick up a copy at one of these used bookstores for two or three dollars. Uh, if you want to read about the war, there are two books. Um, one is another Barbara Tuckman book, The Guns of August, which explains why the war ended, uh, did not end in 1914. And then a more recent book that I bet somebody in here has already read uh, that came out last year. Any of you read Lawrence in Arabia? I love that book. I, I just thought it was, was terrific. And, and, and with this whole sort of uh, discussion about Lawrence, uh, you find it's all about World War I, and you see this view of, of the European countries, the Ottoman Empire falling, and I really loved that book. So uh, it's, they still have it on the table over there at Parnassus. If you want a copy today, I'm sure they will be delighted to sell you one. The public library has multiple copies of that book, too, and it really is a fine, fine uh, book. I enjoyed it tremendously. So before the war began, we see Germany coming to power. We have these uh, pictures of the Kaiser. And, you know, this might kind of tell you a little bit about this man's ego. Uh, <laughs> you know, people didn't really run around dressed like this, even if you were the head of Germany. I mean, and, and you know, he has this handlebar mustache that just looks like some greasy character in a silent movie whose Simon Legree is twitching his waxed mustache. And then this hat, the, the hat. You military people will not like me calling that his hat. I know, I'm just doing it to irritate you. So to see if you notice, you military guys, you will not like me calling that his hat. But his helmet, I mean, can you imagine, even in a big parade, dressing like uh, the, the President of the United States, dressing like that, even in 1912. Um, and, and, you know, one of the problems associated with this war is that all those European leaders are kin to each other. Uh, uh, you know, they're all cousins, and, and uh, that was uh, the, uh, part of the problem. Nicholas II uh, is the Tsar of Russia. Here he is with his cousin, the King of England, George V. And uh, these people have a lot of... of uh, interaction at royal funerals and weddings, uh, but, uh, you know, this old guard is about to pass. Yes? You know, on that topic, there's a really interesting book. It's called The Road to 1914, The War That Ended Peace. And it's all about all the treaties and interrelationships. 
leaderships of all the rulers of Europe and how they basically blundered their way into World War I. And is that book by some, a woman named Macmillan? Yes. Yes, I, I have seen the book. I haven't read the book, but it is on it is on my radar screen. The, this book is is uh, the road to 1914, and she wrote another book about four or five years ago. I can't remember the title of it, but Paris. Yes, yes. After the war, and now we're going to before the war. Yeah. Right. Well, it was, yes, I, 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 and we will certainly talk about that. So I will, when, when you get my book list, you'll get it at least by the last day of class. I will be sure to put those two books on my, on my book list because I know that the people who come to Osher classes are great readers, and uh, we want to keep you busy from here on out for the rest of their summer. And, you know, I might actually pick up uh, that um, uh, Margaret Macmillan book uh, next. I'm, I'm about 60 pages from the end of The Goldfinch, and those of you who read it will know that I can't. I'm sort of like Ronald Reagan. I can't get to, to 1914 until I get those 60 pages read, hopefully this afternoon, but it's, it is a fine book. So the lights are going to go out all over Europe. This is where we are going to take up what is the involvement uh, of the United States, what is our uh, uh, moral uh, position, what is our economic position. And then don't forget, because they're coming back, our relations with Mexico, because this is going to become one of those sparks that will ultimately get us there. Um, it is... 1214. Now, if any of you have a burning question, raise your hand. If it's not just totally burning, um, you can come up here and talk to me after class. I know some of you all have other things to do uh, uh, today. So thank you once again, as always, for your attention.